What's up, everybody? Welcome to Real Time for the Real Everyday Movie Fan. I'm Ryan Murphy, and it's my great pleasure to bring to you today uh, Mr. Dominic Tui, uh, Special Effects Supervisor in the UK. Mr. Tui, thank you so much for being with us today. Pleasure. Thank you very much for asking. Absolutely. Uh, so, of course, um, you are a Special Effects Supervisor, which for those of you, who, those who haven't watched some of our previous interviews, is the practical side of the effects, right? It's, it's, the, it's the stuff that you're actually doing on set. That's right. Yeah. Well, um, the difference um, for our department is we're um, the, we're the physical side. So it's anything in real time is um, is what we do. So, like we say, in real time. So if it's going to rain, we'll do the rain. If it's pyrotechnics, we'll do the explosions. If it's making a room shape for a, an earthquake scene, um, we'll do all of that. Anything that interacts with the actors in real time is what we do. Absolutely, and. Uh... When we talked a little bit about your beginnings and how you got in, into the business, first of all, um, are you coming to me from London? Uh, are you from London originally, or what part of the UK are you from? Yeah, I'm from London, uh, central London. We're from that's where I was born and bred. Um, in, uh, I was born in Highbury, uh, where there's a famous football team um, that I'm very fond of, Arsenal. Um, and uh, that's I did my my schooling in the southwest of um, of London, and um, and now that's where I live here now. So what, what was it that brought you into the world of special effects? Growing up, were you into movies? Did you want to make movies? Or what brought you into that world? I can remember seeing my first film, um, which um, really um, made me wonder how things were done. In fact, there were two films. Uh, one of the films was, believe it or not, was the first Star Wars, um, which as a, a young teenager, I remember being blown away by the characters and by the lightsabers and uh, and all that kind of stuff. And the other film that was very similar um, that did it was Bugsy Malone. Uh, that film, uh, for me, the fact that the, the kids could drive cars um, was something that got my kind of attention and, and loved watching films. I can remember going with my parents and seeing them on the big screen. And, and that, I think, was the moment where I was like, this is pretty cool. <laughs> So then, uh, what, was, what was it like from the professional side? When, 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 how did you try to get into the business, and, and what was it that led you to the path of, of being where you are today? Well, well, I was very lucky. My father works in the industry. Um, he's on the production side, and, um, and as growing up, I was, I was very much into making things with my hands, um, into models and um, art. Um, I did um, technical drawing and metal work at school. And uh, he knew that I was uh, wasn't on the production side wasn't a part for me. You know, he knew that it would have to be something that was more creative and more hands on. Um, and I was very lucky in my summer holidays. My dad was working on a film, and he asked me if I could um, if I could help. Um, and the idea was I had to get twenty of my mates, and we were going to go down onto a ship in London called HMS Belfast, and we had to lift this cover off. And he said, "Look, come to work to me today." Bring all the guys' telephone numbers with you, and uh, I'll let you know if we're going to use it. And of course, like everything in the film industry, it never quite happened. And um, I ended up going for the whole of my summer um, holiday, which was six weeks, and I worked on the film. And for me, it was a great lesson in how films were made and the structure, and seeing how um, how film was put together. Being on on that kind of side, my dad was a first assistant director. Um, so it was really good. And ironically, the film that we're working on, the special effects guys that were working on it, they work for a company called Effects Associates. And, uh, and in the UK, they were a very big um, organisation at the time. I mean, when I'm saying at the time, they were maybe 15 guys um, and they were doing the film. And I got on really well with the guys that were working on there. And um, when the project came to the end, I went to college. And um, I was going to study to be um, uh, a sports teacher. Um, when I was at school, I was, I, was, I was pretty good at sport. And, um, and I was going to go into that side. And I, I did a week at college. And my dad came up to me and he said, how's it going? How's it going? And I said, Amazing. Really, really good. And he said, are you enjoying it? Oh, it's OK. And are you learning a lot? It's OK. He said, well, you've come to a crossroads. You, you either need to stay on that path or... Um, why don't you give the guys that we were working with on the film, the special effects boys, a, a, um, a call and, and see if they need some help? Um, I phoned the, the boss 
at the time, a guy called Martin Guttridge. And uh, I asked if I could come down. And he said, yeah, come down. And uh, he said, uh, on a Friday, if you come and see me, I'm going to ask you a few questions. And if you pass the questions, you can come on a Monday. So on a Friday, I used to go and see him. And uh, he used to ask me how many cups of tea I'd made and if I'd swept up and if I'd done all my duties. And I said, yes. And he would say, OK, you can come back next week. And um, I ended up staying there for 20 years. Hmm. Uh, um, so I can make a good cup of tea and I'm pretty good at coffee as well. So um, that was my my start into the industry, working for a company called Effects Associates, um, of which um, a lot of the top special effects guys in the UK also came through. So Neil Corbold, Chris Corbold, Paul Corbold, <laughs> the late Joss Williams, um, they all did some kind of apprenticeship at Effects Associates. And um, and that really was my my learning. My learning was with a group of people that um, were like a family. And that's um, what really kept me in the industry. Um, they were so kind. Um, we were very lucky. We did lots of projects. So we would work on films. We would work on commercials. We would work on pop promos. Um, basically, anything that needed any kind of effect, we would um, we would we would do it. So, uh, model work, fiberglassing, engineering, um, pneumatics, electronics, all of that was done by a small group of people, and um, and it was a fantastic learning a learning place for me. And um, I wish there could be that in the UK now for the young special effects guys that are coming through. Uh, unfortunately, there's not. And so it's much more difficult nowadays to um, to get that training. And like I said, I did 20 years there before I, I ventured off and did my uh, my own kind of projects. Well, it's interesting you mentioned Effect Associates and your, your pals, the Corbolts over there, because I don't know if you noticed this when I sent you uh, some of the stuff leading up to this interview that we'd done, but I did interview Neil Corbolt, and he said basically this. He said, well, I worked at a place called Effects Associates. A lot of great people came from there. Dominic Tui came from there. So he basically dropped your name just like you dropped his, talking about the same place. But, um, but uh, no, the interesting thing to me is you, you worked, you know, if you go on to IMDb, you see your, your credits, you know, and, and you, you have a lot of credits as special effects technician, you know, smaller roles kind of building up, uh, floor supervisor. But then you I believe your first actual credit as the top dog, the uh, the special effects supervisor was on the Cleopatra miniseries from uh, mid 2000s. Uh, was that I mean, what's that like when you when you've been working at this for so long, you've been working at this for 20 years or whatever, however long it was at the time. And then you have finally you are the special effects supervisor. Was that a pretty nerve wracking experience? Well, the funny thing about it is, is that um, you, you don't you don't get time to think about it, if I'm really honest with you. Um what's been very fortunate with myself is I've been very lucky to, um, to work with some very um, um, accomplished um, people in all departments. And what happens is as you grow up, you, you grow with them and then they get given an opportunity and they ask for you to come and help them because um, they know that you're try you're, you know, a hundred percent and you're, you're, you're doing a good job. So, you feel like you're working with the same friends and you're just trying to do the same job as you were when you were the floor supervisor or when you were working. So um, it's, it's strange. Um, if I'm really honest with you, I, I didn't think that it was that big a deal. I just felt it was a job that we needed to do and I wanted it to be, to be, to be right. Uh, and thankfully, uh, you mean, I'd, I was still working at Effects Associates at the time, and we were a band of, like I say, 12, maybe 20 guys and girls, and we were a family. And and I was I was the head of the family for that project, and everybody said, right, okay, we're gonna we're gonna help Dom do this. So um, yeah, that 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 didn't feel like my first kind of supervisory role, but it was it was one that I got acknowledged for, which was 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 fantastic for me. Really good. Absolutely. And and the other interesting thing is that, you know, as we go along, a lot you and the uh, Corbolds, you know, the Corbold family have shared a lot of franchises. You both worked, I mean, you did on the Mission Impossible franchise, you did Rogue Nation, then Neil did um, Fallout right after that. Uh, Neil did the Snow White or the Snow White and the Huntsman, then you did the Huntsman Winter's War. Uh, between the three of you, between you and Chris and Neil, you guys did the whole new Star Wars series. 
Um, is that just a coincidence or are you guys recommending each other and, and putting, you get, putting each other in those positions sort of? I, I'd love to say that, uh, um, I'd love to say that, uh, the, the, the funny thing about it is, is in my opinion, I, I think um, between Neil and Chris Corbold and Paul Corbold, I think that they are the, the, one of the top special effects supervisors in the UK. Um, fortunately for me, they can't do everything. And, um, and uh, we get an opportunity to, um, to show our skills as well. So um, I, I'm fully aware of where we are in that kind of pecking order um, of, of how things happen. But in the same breath, um, I feel that we've got a very accomplished team that work for me. And I feel that we, we do as, as equal a job as they would do. Um, and I think that's because of our training and our background of when we were younger. Um, I think we've all got the same work ethics. I think we've all got the same uh, goal. Um, uh, so I, I, it, look, it was fantastic that we got an opportunity to work on the Star Wars franchise. Um, our first one was working on Solo. Um, which was was fantastic for us. It was such a such a um, a big project with loads of effects, loads and loads of effects. Um, and then that that got us into the family of the of the Lucas films. And then um, unfortunately, Chris was going to do it, but it it clashed with um, with the Bond. Um, and so, like all things, you you go with with what you know and who you know. And uh, we've done a good job for them on Solo. So we were given the opportunity to do to do Star Wars Nine, and 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 that was was fantastic. Um, working with JJ Abraham on a, on a big project like that uh, it is it is one of those moments where it, you you really look forward to to going to work and and what can you do and how can you learn? Um, like you said before, we've we've been very fortunate. We've we've worked with Tom Cruise. I think we've done three projects with Tom Cruise. Um, unfortunately, the, the the last mission that we did with Tom, um, the same thing that happened to Chris Corbold in working on the Star Wars. I, I'd been asked to do another project, so we couldn't work on the next um, on the next uh, Mission Impossible. And, and that's just unfortunate how things work out. Um, but I've got to say that I thought Neil did a fantastic job on it. And uh, in my opinion, uh, Tom Cruise is the one of the hardest working, most professional actors that I think I've ever worked with. And, um, and someone for our department, it's a real pleasure to work with Tom because um, he, he, knows, he knows how to make the effect work to its best. And his athleticism uh, and his, I mean, he's, he's a true movie star. Um, he, he really does get the best out of what you're doing because you know that it's Tom. There's no, there's no chance to jump in with the, uh, with the stunt double. Uh, Tom is there. So that makes you up your game when you're, when you're doing your effects so that you, um, cause you know, Tom will be on the end of it. Well, that's interesting. I was going to ask you about Tom Cruise because I talked with him. I talked about him with Neil Corbel cause we talked about doing mission impossible fallout and, uh, cause he's so famous these days for, the kind of crazy stuff he'll want to pull. Like he's just like, he just like wants to do like crazy things just for the sake of being able to tell his grandkids he did them. Um, I mean, what, what were some of the stuff on the three films you work with him that was just like the, the stuff that he would volunteer for stuff that he, that he would want to do. I mean, what were some of the crazy things that you had to do with him? Well, I think, I think if you, if you, I mean, the very first time we worked with Tom was on, on edge of tomorrow, which I think got changed to live, die, repeat. I think, um, which was a, a war film. And, um, and I remember meeting Tom and, and um, there was going to be a sequence where um, he said, I want to wear this big suit and I want to be running through and I, I want to smash a car out of the way as if it's, I mean, as if it wasn't there. And, um, and we said, yeah, sure. You mean, we can do that. We make a lightweight car and we'll, we'll um, prepare it so we can put it on a nitrogen ram and pull it out of the way and all this kind of stuff. And um, he was like, it can't look false. It, it, it has to look like I've hit the car. And we were like, sure, sure, sure. And I remember when we, when we shot it and, and he was frame by frame. Um, he want, he wanted to believe that he'd hit the car. And, um, 
And the reality is, is he, he he physically did. I mean, there was there was no. T- that's why we built it the way it did. So that was our first kind of um, meeting with Tom, and um, we did all kinds of things where we suspended him inside the drop ship, and um, we had the whole set moving whilst there was a a camera that came right through the centre of the set, and there was millimeters, and um, and Tom had to drop out of this position, and he. he he he's one of those people that you kind of go, oh well, we'll cut. You know I mean, You'll, we'll do all of this, then we'll cut, then we'll we'll go to another angle, and then there'll be a stuntman dropping through. And Tom was like, no, 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 we're the whole scene. We're going to run the whole scene. I think it was two two pages of dialogue, and then I'm going to drop. And um, and and it it really is something that after you do the first effect with him you realize that he's going to do this to everything. So <laughs> that was, that was a great, that was a great start for us. And then, um, we got into mission and, um, and he was, um, I mean, he's a very accomplished, um, driver, whether it be a car or a motorbike. And, um, we started talking about sequences with Tom and how he was going to throw this car around and what he was going to do. And, and, we were saying like, you mean we'll put a blind driver in this for you, Tom? And, and he was like, "Why?" <laughs> and, and you and you suddenly realise that you you don't, you don't say those things. You you, you 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 don't you don't aid him because um, he can do it. So um, mission was called cool. strapping them onto the outside of the aeroplane, um, building the rig that supported the camera um, through the um, through the the two windows of the A four hundred. Was was something that I don't think we're ever going to do again. <laughs> I remember saying to Tom, he, we we I was concerned about his eyes because um, I think when that when the plane takes off, I think it gets up to 140 miles an hour, um, and we were concerned that if there'd been a little fly or some kind of debris that had flicked up and it, it hit his eye, that you mean we could potentially blind him. And um, Tom was like. Good point. Let's start looking into what lenses we could uh, we could put in there. So he wore some specially made lenses, uh, which impaired his vision, and um, he he got on the outside of that plane and and he, I think we did it six times in the end, and um, and he he you really there's that point where it just takes off, and I remember being inside the plane when we did it, and even my stomach dropped. And I thought, what must it be like to be on the outside of that? I, I can't imagine what he's going through with a uh, impaired in vision and, I mean, literally being flown through the air. Um, and it was it was so cold as well at that day. So um, that was another kind of moment where you're, wow, we've done the underwater stuff with him on Mission Impossible as well, where he held his breath for such a long time. We built all kind of rigs for him to be manipulated under the water. Uh, and, and, it, and it really is one of those great situations with Tom where you, you, he, he, he's up for the experiment. He's up for doing something that hasn't been done before. And he really embraces that. And he, um, his attention to detail and um, safety is so high that you, you, you know you're doing something that's very dangerous, but he's so focused that you've rehearsed with him um if something should go wrong this is what happens and um you, you just feel comfortable that he is going to really he's gonna he's gonna follow that through and then obviously we did uh, the mummy with tom and we went out to Namibia and we built a, a collapsing building um that tom stood on the top of and then rode it down um which we were very we, we, as a department, we were very pleased with. I mean, we managed to reset the building in less than an hour, and uh, for them to do the next take on it and all that kind of stuff. Um, and and you, you, you get a good relationship with him, and, and he trusts you. And I think that's the that's the key to it. Uh, if he doesn't trust you, then then um, he, he won't do it. Um, so preparation is so important when when you're working with Tom. Um, and he's one of those people that, um, like I say, I can't speak highly enough about him. He's, uh, he's probably the top professional um, that I've ever worked with. Yeah. Um, 
and then it's interesting you you could talk you go on to do solo and that was obviously a um an interesting project because you changed directors halfway through um I, I won't ask about the politics or anything about that, but I mean, what, what was that like? Did you guys, were you guys just, you had to halt production for about a week and then thankfully you'd worked with Ron Howard already before. So when he came in, that must've been very familiar. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, um, it, it's always, it's always um, sad when something like that happens. Um, Phil and Chris Lord um, were um, amazing through solo. Um, I think they don't get enough credit for it. If I'm honest with you, um, the whole look of the film, the the style of the film, the clothes, um, the wardrobe, the hair, the um, everything was down to those guys. They picked all of that. The vehicles that um, that we made, um, the Moloch's vehicle and uh, and Solo's car, and we physically built them. Our department built them. Um, they were so instrumental in all of that. Um, and they they were very grounded about what they believed was right. So you we I built up a great relationship with them, and 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 I thought it was sad when they went because they put so much time and effort into it. Um, but then, like everything in the film industry, you have to move on. There, there isn't time to um, to dwell on that. Um, obviously, Ron came in. Um, He's an amazing director. I mean, um, the interesting thing was watching the two, the two styles of the directors work with the artists, and and he he was very clear and and was very focused about what he wanted from that. He already knew that the film had been half. We were more than halfway through production, and he knew that the film could almost run itself because everybody knew what they were doing. Uh, and he, he just allowed us to, to continue on that same vein. Um, and I, I, I personally think Solo is a great film. I, I think it, um, it didn't do so well. I know in the Star Wars um, kind of um, enthusiast, but mm -hmm. I, I, thought it, I thought it was good. I thought it had good humour. I thought that um, there was lots of positives. Uh, I just feel it came out at the wrong time, if I was honest with you. Um, and I think everyone, it was too close to number eight, in my opinion. Um, I think if it had come out later, I think it would have done much better. And I think the Star Wars fans would have been a bit more kind of susceptible to it, whereas I think they weren't quite happy with eight as well. So, um, but yeah, no, that was that was another, another great experience. Like I say, working with the Lucas family. Um, can't i mean they're, they're a pleasure to work with they they really are they they know their stuff and uh, i mean who doesn't want to work on a star wars project <laughs> well if i may be allowed to say so the that's my favorite one of all the five new films is solo i think that that's the best one i can't understand why it didn't do as well uh, either critically or financially it's i think it's a glorious film i think it's a um great script from lawrence kazan and everybody so but what can you do? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Like you, you work on projects and you never know. I mean, it's um, sometimes you work on a film and um, you really enjoy the experience of it and and, it, and people don't like it. Uh, you, the, and the opposite happens. You work on something that's really hard work and it's not, it's not such a great memorable experience and people go, that's a great film. Um, so you, you, you never know. I mean, we, we've been very fortunate. Um, the last project that we just finished, which was 1917, was 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 the pinnacle of that. It was was um, was everything that you want. It was well organised. It was a fantastic story. Uh, it read really well. Um, the collaboration between all departments was was fantastic and i think it, um, everyone was on the top of their game um and then when you see the technical side of what how the film was made um i think people i, I mean I, I great i get great pleasure from people saying they really enjoyed it um i hope you did but uh, most people that i've speak i've spoken to from all ages from you I mean from teenagers through to um to adults in their 70s and 80s um, have all enjoyed it and, and that's when you realise that it's not your your own professional um, pride that you have when you watch something it's when other people really enjoy it that you think wow this is that was 
was a fantastic thing to work on. Well, at the end, and uh, you got recognized for it, obviously. Uh, I want to talk about that in a second, but uh, the yeah, 1917 is obviously such such a um, unique project. I mean, such a uh, hey, you know, let's make a you know two hour film in in what looks like one shot. Um, obviously, working with Sam Mendes had to be a great experience. I think a lot of people wonder though what it was like working with Roger Deakins. He's sort of sort of the superstar of that film um, and and everything. But overall, I just I mean between Sam Mendes and Roger Deakins and. I'm a film crew nerd, so I know names like Stuart Wilson, and and just that that would had to be just such a great thing to work on with all those tremendously talented people, and it won Oscars. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, it, um, it, I think like all things, you you, you get asked to do a project. Um, you never know when you get asked if they if these projects are going to be nominated or are, are going to be seen as being something that could could win an award. I've never taken a film or worked on a film with that being the, the goal of it. Um, I've always taken the project because people have asked me to do it. Um, and we're always, always give 100%. So um, when we got asked to do that and um, and you do your homework, you mean, uh, you mean Sam Menace's name gets mentioned and, and you start watching films that Sam's made so that you you can see his kind of way that he tries to work. You obviously talk to other technicians within the industry because obviously Sam has done two two of the bonds. And um, and, and you, you, you try to find out as much as you can so that you can help yourself when you're making these films. So Roger was another person, um, hugely, hugely um, talented, has been doing it for such a long time and it wasn't until Blade Runner that he got he got acknowledged for for the Oscar. Um, so to work with these guys is great. But what's even what's even what's lovely when you work with these people is is they're so normal. Um, <laughs> they 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 are um, extremely polite, they're extremely grateful um, and they're 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 focused. They they their instructions are very clear and i think that's what makes them stand out uh, against other people is that if you think uh, trying to make a film is all about um, letting people uh, express themselves so that they can help you make a film but it's also not allowing them to um, do stuff that you don't want so sam mendis was very clear about um, what he wanted and and the rhythm of the film and how um, he was going to shoot it, um, and that's 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 fantastic for someone like our department. Um, um, Roger was a pleasure, Sam was a pleasure, um, and they they embraced our 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 help in the film. Um, we got very, quite heavily involved in in the uh, in the the flares. Uh, if, towards the end of the film when uh, we go into a, a town called Acoust. Um, obviously, George, the artist, is a fantastic actor. I've got to say, I've got a lot of time for George. Um, I don't know if you remember, he goes up some stairs and then when he goes to the, gets to the top of the stairs, uh, there's a, a German soldier that fires at him and it all goes black. And I think it's the first time in the film that it just goes black. And then you hear the dripping of water and then for us, that's when the scene starts. Um, we had a drip rig that had the drip on his face um, and the shot plays as one. Um, I think it was five or six drips. George wakes up. He, um, he gets up. He goes over to the stairs. He crawls out, up the stairs. You go into the room. And as you go into the room, we let off one of these magnesium flares that we had on, on a winch system. And it was really important that we had 20 odd seconds. I think we had 20, 22 seconds that the flare had to travel um, from the ground to 100 foot into the air to 300 foot along and then come back down. And the flare had to be burning for that period of time. And what that allowed to happen was the shadows within that set to move. And the, the set was specifically designed to allow for the light to shine through and the shadows to move across that interior of that room. And then the camera still carries on coming forwards. And what you don't realize is that the window that you're walking towards, um, 
basically is like a, a set of lift doors and it all moves out the way and it lowers to allow the camera to come through. And as the camera goes through, it goes black. And that's our cup win. And that was, was spoken about in great lengths. And so we knew what we had to do and we knew how we wanted to execute it. So the pressure was on to, to do that. Um, when you're dealing with pyrotechnics, to try and make something be so consistent um, is very difficult. Um, and also, you know, moving it up in the air and moving it 100 foot up, 300 foot along and 100 foot down is, is also very difficult as well. And getting the timing right with the camera. And so just something that sounds as simple as that was was so complicated and and then obviously the shot continues and i think we let off another four flares in a set whilst um george is running through it um and all of those positions were were given by roger and sam um the art department um did a fantastic job in building a scaled model and we had a, a little electric light bulb that um, showed the path of the flare so we could kind of guess where the shadows were going to be given. Um, and like I say, it, 1917 was just a pleasure to work on. <laughs> but every shot, every shot, um, we were involved in some, in, some, um, in some way or another, whether it be with um, furniture moving or doors opening, windows moving out the way. Um, helping the camera get onto a position or off of, of, a, of a rig. Um, it, it was really one of those things where, for me, it was great to be on the set. I, I was on the set every day. I, I, I kind of did the floor supervisor as well as the supervising the job. And, and for me, um, it, was a, it was a true draw. It was just, I can't speak highly enough of it. So to do that, uh, and to really enjoy that that process of uh, work, and then to get a, uh, the accolades at the end with the the Oscar and the BAFTA. Um, I think it's my 36th year in doing special effects, and um, it, it, it's it's lovely. I mean, it, re it really is nice. But it's a team effort. Uh, I've said this before, and I'm very very fortunate. I have a fantastic team of. Um, uh, of men and women that work for me uh, and we really are a family and we, we try to we try to look after one another and we, we we that was one of those jobs when it was it was a real joy to go to work and the oscar goes to 1917 he on greg butler and dominic tui this is the second Oscar and second nomination for Guillaume Rocheron, and first win and second nomination for Greg Butler, and the first win and third nomination for Dominic Dewey. Thank you for the Academy for this tremendous honor. 1917 is what you call a dream project, an opportunity to challenge how we approach visual effects, but also a chance to collaborate with some truly fantastic people. Thank you to Sam Mendes for being so inspirational and leading us through you know, this epic journey. Uh, I want to thank our producers, Pipa, Jenan, and Callum, everybody at Amblin and Universal for your collaboration and support. Uh, thank you to my beautiful wife, Kate, for standing me right by me in every step of the way. And I want to thank the team of 600 artists at MPC and our fantastic special effects team. We share this award with you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much. All the kids at home, thank you, the team. Thank you. Thank you. And I think there's lots of things that I'm sure they won't want me to tell you how we did them. Um, because that is the smoke and mirrors of it. But I'm sure one day it's going to come out how some of these shots were actually put together. And, um, and, and that's when you're, you see the real craftsmanship of those people working. Well, I think actually from what I've heard, I haven't listened to it myself, but there's a DVD, uh, DVD commentary by, by Roger Deakins that apparently, I, from what I've heard, it just shatters the illusion for you. So 
he may have already given away all the secrets. But uh, well, if, if there's there's two people that can give that away, one is Sam and one is Roger. So that's great. Then that if they if that's what, if they're the two that are talking about it, then um, then they they deserve to um, to be able to tell you how their um, how the tricks were were um, accomplished because uh, uh, it was very very clever, very clever. Well, as we come up on the end here, obviously um, there's one project that you've been working on, um, and that is the Batman, and clearly. Um, things didn't go quite as planned. Uh, I think you guys were a couple months into shooting when um, everything shut down. Uh, and obviously, I mean, I, can, I can't ask really anything about this because you can't say really anything about it, but uh, within the very small confine of what you can say about the production, uh, working with Matt Reeves, working with Robert Pattinson, um, whoever else, I don't even know if you've gotten to shoot with Andy Serkis, Zoe Kravitz, all the people yet, but uh, what can you say about the Batman and what it's been like working on and, and how soon do you expect to be able to get back to work? Um, as you know, we're, what with the COVID-19 at this moment in time, it, it brought production to a, to, a, to a close. We are waiting to be told to go back to work. I know that they're very keen for everybody to, to start up. Um, it was unfortunate because we were just about to do a really cool sequence with the Batmobile, um, which we've been... Um, our department has been heavily involved in building the bat car. Um, and what I would say about this Batman um, is this it's very different. Um, and I think that's what the appeal will be. I think Matt Reeves has, has written a, a, a very good script. Um, it's very strong. And I think if you look at the, the cast that um, are playing those parts, um, they, they just bring more to to the table and, and I, I, I hope that everyone enjoys it. it so far it's been it's been great to work on um, we've only done a few weeks of nights because unfortunately Batman only comes out at night so that's quite hard um, but um, we, we look forward to starting up hopefully in the near future absolutely and uh, it's it's been great to be with you thank you very much for uh, this opportunity uh, and uh, yeah, that's all. I, I, we're all looking forward to the Batman and seeing what else you have up your sleeve. And I look forward to seeing the rest of, uh, of what you have in the future. Great. Well, thank you very much. It's been great talking to you. All right, my guys. Dominic Tui, Special Effects Supervisor in the UK. Uh, that'll do us for today. What did you think of the interview? Let us know. And uh, tell us uh, what you thought of all these films, 1917, the films that he's worked on. And are you looking forward to the Batman? Until next time, I'm Ryan Murphy. And thank you for keeping it real with Real Time.